Hello everyone, so we're going to talk about uh, the view from the other side. Yeah, so um, let me just quickly introduce myself as well as my colleagues. So my name is Judith Bernard Morva, I'm the Credit and Collections Manager at Unisys. I have had that role for the past nine years and I still like it, so <laughs> it's over to you. Um, my name is Anna Ramanda. I'm working at Hitachi Data Systems here in Krakow. Um, I've been with uh, Hitachi Data Systems for almost five years now, as currently as a team leader for cash and collection team. And I'm leading a team of five currently, and I hope my experience will be somehow benefit uh, for you. Okay, hello, my name is Stan Halosek. I'm based in Prague, Johnson Johnson, uh, credit collection manager. All right, so to start off with, we have a question for you. Somewhere. And please vote. So, which of the following is the most difficult to communicate with, in your opinion? Is it sales, customer service, or internal line managers? <laughs> yes, yeah, sort of expected, I think. <laughs> All right. Um, then, Anna, could you share probably a story that you had with the sales department where you found it extremely difficult to achieve something? <laughs> Definitely a lot of stories and I'm sure uh, our audience will want to share their stories as well um, so Hitachi Data Systems is a sales uh, organization and um, they the mm, balance is um, shifted uh, a lot to the sales and um, a lot of pressure comes from the sales organization to the credit and um, from the cash and collection perspective, uh, we do involve uh, sales uh, if we have difficult customers to collect from. And there are a lot of different stories. Uh, and they are both bad and uh, difficult experiences, but also um, very good experiences. And um, starting with the uh, difficult ones, um, there are always uh, sales uh, sales guys, uh, mostly because we're in IT d uh, business, um, who then, who have um, a very long uh, relationship with customers, uh, much longer than anyone from collection or accounts receivable or credit. And um, they sometimes, um, agree on terms that uh, are do not follow exactly the official version and or official terms that we have and the ones that we would like to follow and uh, in such situations um, we both try to negotiate with the customer and uh, with the sales on uh, what would be the best outcome and both for us as a company but also um, somehow trying to um, honor uh, the relationship with, with the sale the sales has with the uh, customer. Uh, of course, um, there are some that would go to customer and just discuss it over a dinner and in such situations um, they do um, have a lot of influence on how our customers pay us. All right, thank you for this. So, um, as you know, this is a panel discussion. We would like to involve you, and we, we're interested in your stories and your opinions. So, we prepared a couple of questions for you. So, first of all, what do you think? What can we, as credit collections, do to improve relations with the sales department? Anybody? Ideas? You can also say something that doesn't work, and we don't do that. I would say perhaps from the beginning, including them in the conversations of uh, risk assessment. Um, maybe one silly point we had always um, as credit collections, we were always trying to make them aware how much effort sales puts into uh, getting new customers in onboarding and earn some money for the company and then showing them how much you can lose on the other side. When you go onboard the wrong customers, they were sometimes even motivated to support credit collections in this way. 
No? Okay. Uh, so I, I have one experience to share. Here. Yeah. Um, so a couple of years ago, uh, I'm from Delphi, my name is Piotr. Um, we, we, we had uh, issues with accounts receivable, with past use, and then there was a discussion on a, on a very high level in the, in the management of the company where our, our leadership, they, they gave the goals to sales department and make them responsible for our receivable metrics. And that was, that was the key for the success. So when, when they received this information from the leadership, uh, of course, we needed to talk to our, convince our leadership that they need to pass this message to sales people and give them in their uh, even in their PVP they have the goals that our, our receivable metrics. When there were metrics were there, uh, it was much easier to talk to them. And then we, we had uh, the same goals, right? We we are sharing the same target, the same goal. And since then, the discussion is just going much much better, and it's 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 been just completely different than it used to be in the past. And is there compensation tied to the results? Or is it just a sets of goals that they have? Com compensation tied to the results? Yeah, yeah, the, yeah their bonus. Yeah. Yes, it, it is. For, for people at a certain level, it, it is. Okay. So it, it, it does, and it really helps. Of course, it's not perfect, but, but it's, it, it helps a lot, really. Yeah, thank you. I think that's something that we really like. You know, um, my company is in the IT services industry, and salespeople generally think that they, they know what they are doing, and we're just there to hold them back, sort of and that their conversation is not tied to any of the AR results or the AR goals at all. So we sometimes find it really difficult to, you know, to achieve what we want from them because at the end of the day, um, in my company, the business unit is responsible for um, AR. So if something goes wrong, it's, it's their um, responsibility. Um, and, you know, sometimes I have the feeling that I do collections on the salespeople as well, not just on the clients. To you to achieve, you know what I want. Yeah, we have a question there. Yeah, so I just wanted to mention that from my perspective, it's very important to build a relationship between the sales organization and the collection and credit department, because we can help each other really well if we all know what we are doing. Because usually the sales teams think that we want to scare their customers or you know just collect <laughs> the money no matter what. And this is not our objective. We want to make the business going. So this is really important that the sales team is aware what we are doing and we are aware what the sales team is doing currently. Because sometimes they are in the nego negotiation with the customers around very big deals and they don't want us to call the customers to ask for money at this very point. So it's really good to have good relationship and ongoing communication with the sales and credit collections teams. And how do you achieve that? Like you talk to them regularly or you have meetings or? Uh, yes, we talk to them regularly. So when we have very important customers, we uh, like to know who is the responsible sales representative. Sometimes we even include them in the uh, account statements that we send to the customer. So they are aware of the customer situation. All right, that's interesting. Thank you. Yeah, just uh, one point from my side in order to uh, improve uh, uh, the relationship between uh, uh, credit team and, and, uh, and sales organization. What we have done at Lego as well is that we have tried to uh, 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 tell the, uh, the sales people, come to us before you go and approach a new customer. Let's evaluate on the customer up front so that you know what conditions you can offer to the customers in advance. By that you are proactive towards the sales organization to show your worth and your capabilities on, on, on this. Right, thank you. Uh, I also wanted to comment, I, I uh, think that uh, for cooperation between not only sales uh, and collections and credit, but also uh, operations and uh, collections and credit, it's very important also uh, for collectors and credit people to understand the business, the nature of the business and the background, even technical, <coughs> partially technical background of the business. So for instance, we in Johnson Controls, we started uh, to organize uh, the rotation programs for people in business going to finance for some time for a while, and but also the opposite way, uh, some kind of rotation program for our collections people to go there, and specifically if you are working in shared service center, so usually, to be honest, you hire the people for credit and collections who really are not aware about the nature of the business, the production, and sales, so, so you yes. need somehow to let them know about this. Yeah, that's a very good point. Thank you for raising that. All right, so um, 
how do you think the sales team view you in your company? Like a source of aid or, you know, just an annoying department that we should not consider? Yes? I think a lot depends on the size of the company and its philosophy. In my company, I would say we are a global company, a global company with a, a lot of decentralization and empowerment of the local people. So obviously, when you start to tell them, you know, I'm going to stop the sales because, uh, or stop the shipments because uh, your customer are out of the credit limit, the, the reply comes immediately, this is not your business. <laughs> So that's, that's, it's very important to have a good relationship with, uh, with, uh, with the local people, the commercial people. And the second uh, element I would like to bring as well is a cultural aspect. I mean, the, the culture in Central and Eastern Europe is totally different from the culture in the Middle East. And relationship is different as well. That's true. That's very true. I have the same experience just within the different sales departments within Europe. Because if you talk to somebody, let's say in Switzerland, or somebody in France, or somebody in, I don't know, Sweden, yeah, they have a different ways of doing things. So that's, that's very true. Um, anybody else would like to share their experience on this? All right, if not, then we're going to move on. So do you think that customer service delayed the resolution of invoice disputes? We don't have a customer service in our uh, company, so it's over to you, probably, to respond to this one. Yeah, so I think it really depends, like, uh, on the customer service, and it also depends a lot on the people, because as you, the question before, it's also about people. It's not only about the process, but there are like people who are really communicative, helpful, but then there are like people, even from the sales department, that if you send them something, they say, "Why should I see it?" You know. And then at the end of the day, if they go to a customer where there are problems with it, they say, oh, why didn't you tell me? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it really depends always on the, on the people. Yeah. Even if you do some trainings or insights, there will be some pushbacks from some people. And so it is with customer services. Yeah. There are customer services that cooperate well, and they see disputes as the main task. And some customer services or some people, they are obviously not seeing it as the priority, but sales and orders, you know, so... So you're saying it's more to the actual person who yeah. sits there? Okay, so then we go back to psychology, I think. Okay, I believe that <coughs> it depends on the tools that we have given to the customer service as well to deal with the disputes from the customers. And what is our philosophy again and how do we want to treat the customers at the end of the day? What we are trying to do is we want to kill all the disputes at the very source uh, or at the very first point of capture. So if it is the customer service that picks up the phone of an angry customer having a dispute, we try to give them all the tools so that they can resolve it there on the spot. And I don't know about your companies, but the most common disputes for us is that they've lost the invoice. So they <laughs> want a copy of the invoice. And how do you deliver the invoices? Okay, we have either through EDI or electronic invoices in some countries, mm -hmm. post in other countries, yeah. like Poland, they like post a lot. Uh, do they sometimes tell you that they lost the one that they received on an e in an email? Because that's something common for us and I never understood. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> My team says yes. Yeah? <laughs> All right, and how do you deal with that? What do you tell them? Like, okay, sorry, but I have proof that I sent it to you or, you know, or you accept it and resend it and that's it? You have to resend it, but you it's, it's a process and we train the customers as well. So when you have the customer on the phone and he is complaining that <coughs> he hasn't received the invoice while somebody is asking for the money on the other side, you try to have a discussion and to tell them that what is the means that we're sending the invoice, what would be better for you for next time. So we try to educate them on the go. All right, okay. But this, back to your question, gives the tools to the customer service people to answer. Basically. All right, thank you. Um, 
for disputes, for instance, again, we have kind of different model in Johnson Control. So uh, the, I wouldn't say that, this, uh, that customer service is dealing with the disputes generally in our case. So, mm -hmm. so more or less mostly disputes are technical and performance disputes, quality disputes. And for these uh, collectors, uh, when they call to customer and they register the dispute, the new dispute, so they never go to customer service with the dispute, but they go directly to the dispute resolver, to the technician, mm -hmm. to, to some people who are responsible for quality or even for billing depends on what kind of dispute it is so so it really helps um, uh, to, to push them to, to resolve the dispute as soon as possible if they are in direct contact with the collector so, so no no uh, intermediation through specific uh, sub department of customer service and is it the collector who communicates the the resolution back to the client or is it then the uh... Uh, depends usually it's the dispute resolver in business in operations or sales or whoever or if if there was a project big big project so then usually project manager communicates with uh, with the customer so not the collector but mm -hmm. sometimes depends on the on the type of dispute uh, so sometimes even collector okay and mm -hmm. For instance, of course, uh, for such a disputes like uh, uh, the necessity to resend the invoice, the collectors are dealing with this by themselves. Nobody else is bothered, so they send it by email, usually PDF version, and that's it. So. All right. And the person taking the resolution, do they give a feedback to the collectors as well, or only to the client? Yes, we are communicating with them through the tools. So normally, collections IT tool which we have, so it has uh, also the module for dispute resolvers, uh, which is simple website uh, mm -hmm. through which dispute resolvers communicate with them. So whenever the new dispute is assigned from collector to the to dispute resolver, so dispute resolver receives an email, click to the link in the email, and uh, see the, the nature of the dispute and can accept. Uh, or uh, decline that he's not the one who should resolve it and it goes to another dispute resolver or can close the dispute uh, with some comments, can estimate the resolution date, whatever. And it, this uh, flow goes back to the collector. All right, very good. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think we more or less responded to the next question. Oh, we still have someone here. Yeah, uh, I think it also depends on the company and the, the, uh, how the company treats the complaints. Meaning, in our company a few years ago, uh, it wasn't formally said, but we never make mistakes. Meaning, but if there was the complaint, somebody need to be blamed, and I think this also caused a lot of the tension within the people. So somebody who solved and somebody who did, for example, with the customer. So somebody need to be blamed for the complaint. And after this culture was changed, I think solving the complaints is also easier, meaning we are focusing on solving the complaint instead of finding somebody who should be blamed. Yeah, that's very one. true. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right, next question. So, in your opinion, could it be argued that elements of internal management don't fully understand the potential of shared services? Yeah, anyone? In, in my opinion or in my experience, the answer is yes. It actually depends on you know, the, the corporate culture and where the people come from, but I, I, uh, I have some experiences where I was asked like, okay, but why do you do that? And, and you know, what's your addition to, to resolving a problem? Did you ever had any, any experience like that? Okay, big silence means no, so SSC is very well recognized in your organizations, right? Yeah, I see, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, if I may add, um, it, I think it very much depends on how long the shared service uh, exists or functions in the organization because um, the understanding, the trust uh, grows with time and with uh, shown uh, successes or uh, the involvement that the shared service uh, shows to the stakeholders or internal management um, within time. And uh, I believe that with age uh, we get gain more trust and more empowerment also in shared service center. Anyone would like to comment on that? And how long has your SSC been around? 
um, I believe eight years now, or a little bit longer, nine, almost nine. Yeah, the, the birthday is in November. Right. So, yeah, okay. almost nine. Nine. Again, to Natalia's point around building relationship with the sales, this is exactly the same, uh, like building relationship with internal management, right? So um, we've decided at some point to uh, do this very good exercise to produce uh, some reports, statistics, very good results, what goes very good, but also share the ideas of what now goes wrong and what could be um, what could be uh, fixed in terms of the problems, and we did that on a regular basis, so through bi-weekly calls with the senior inter internal management from all the region, we had some sessions. We just asked also them questions, and uh, with that time. As Anna mentioned, we built a very good relationship and the trust, which is the most important factor here. So well done. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, and how do the other fields? Do you, does management give you um, full empowerment and support? Do you feel the support in your daily work? Okay, I'll take it for a yes. Yeah, <laughs> Sinus is agreeing, right? All right, um, I suggest that we move on and I hand this over to Dan. Yeah. Okay, so just a few aspects I wanted to highlight. A lot of them we already talked about. Um, this is actually the situation in our company, Johnson Johnson a bit. So first of all, what we said also, salespeople are not like uh, based on if the payment arrived, like we touched yesterday, which is sometimes a pity, I guess. Uh, what is happening now is like the increasing portfolios. That means that salespeople have bigger regions, more customers to cover, and this brings us actually to the time pressure when they are not able to answer the queries if we have something and vice versa to contact us sometimes. Um, the other point is also that sometimes they are really good presenters, they are outspoken, but some things that they might say it's not really true, especially in terms of pricing. Connected to it is actually the situation when we have like several business units. We have thousands of products. So actually sometimes like there is a tendency that the salesperson speaks like for his own without agreeing with the other business units. Obviously in terms of for example discounts, it's quite important that everybody agrees on one uh, approach to the customer, yeah, which is sometimes missing. And of course for us it's hard because some of them are doctors but they don't understand accounting at all, like credit notes or what is like the pricing or VAT. So then it's quite hard to, to, to communicate because there is this kind of uh, skill barrier, let's say. Well, also what we have in the past, I, I think that it's changed, uh, changed a bit, is that the salespeople agreed something with the customer and after one year, two years, they were in another region covering different portfolios, different customers, etc. So basically it was hard to track them down and it was nearly impossible to get them back to the same customer because of the responsibility change. So <clears throat> I think this is like the things from the key points, let's say, or the key aspects. I don't know if this works or am I pointing somewhere else? Well, if we look at the, at the Central European market, where we also have like some uh, quite good sales, uh, I think that there is like two really differences. There are markets where the sales force works on the sales and collection department is collecting like Czech, Czech Republic and Slovakia and Poland. But then we have like the Southeast, like Romania and Serbia, where uh, it's like more that the sales even collects. Yeah, so the sales contacts us or we contact the sales people. We should not and we cannot contact the customer directly, uh, but everything goes over the sales. I think this is like not the best practice in our days. The best practice is either like separate departments or that the collection person goes together with the salesperson to the customer uh, because to differentiate like sales and collections. But nevertheless, we will see how we will change the management. So now the question to you since it's interactive and it should not be about me speaking too much. Uh, 
How intense is the interaction of your cash collection departments with the sales force? And it's about the frequencies. So basically, is it none? Is it rare? Is it frequent? Or is it very frequent? So please vote. Okay. So it's good to see that it's really quite relevant, this topic for all of us, I guess. And the next question, Mark asked me to do something like a bit different, not only like sales related. So I'm asking this question. What is the current headcount of the Jan Johnson Johnson GBS organization in Prague? Currently, as we speak, approximately 80, 180, 380, or 480. Please vote. Well, three was the most popular, but actually it's four, and we are still growing. So <laughs> we will not be 60,000 like Krakow may be, but we are still growing. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is like the end from my side. Are there any further questions or something you would like to discuss? Yes, please. I can tell. <laughs> Actually, I was surprised to hear that you are doing collections in Romania with your sales people. This is the same thing that we are doing for in Coco Hellenic in Romania. So is this something that other people who work for Romania see as a pattern? Yeah. Is, is this then a cultural thing, which should not change? Or somebody has changed it. No, we we thought that the customer is like <coughs> okay. I mean when we for installation yeah we go to the but uh, usually we have to contact with the customer. But how efficient the customer is? It's very good and we have a very good relationship. But uh, we are working with distributors, so this is the difference maybe. When it goes maybe to direct business, then maybe you need someone local and speak the language. And this is what we are exploring now because uh, we are planning to go direct in uh, Romania. And we started actually, so you need uh, language skills, local. Okay, language skill apart. Even if you have capital distribution, it's not a problem to go through the sales force to cover the money, to recover the money. So it's work. It's working in Romania like this. So probably it's cultural aspect more than, I don't know, the best practice. Actually, it's interesting because for us it works exactly the opposite. If it's a big customer or a distribution, a wholesaler, then we can contact him directly from the center in Romanian language barrier, not a case, and collect the money. But if it's a small outlet, then the sales would go there to have a discussion about the collection. Do you think this approach could be good in, in other markets as well, or, or does it only work in Romania? Like, would you like to see salespeople actually do collections or more collections? No, no, no. Hmm? I want them to get out of collections. <laughs> okay. Yes, they are there to sell. I think that actually it creates a very bad discussion with the customer. If a salesperson goes there instead of trying to sell and develop the market and have a meaningful discussion, get the discussion into you owe us a thousand euro, where's the money? It puts the discussion in a completely different base, and probably we might lose sales afterwards. Mm -hmm. I, I think once again it depends on the culture. For instance, in my prior company, when I was uh, living in Turkey, uh, the salespeople uh, had uh, a safe in in the truck, and they were collecting the cash oh. when they were selling the product at the same time. And every evening, the cash was coming back to the center and collected there. So it was the way it was going to small, small shops. Uh, you cannot do it the other way. But do you think it's the, it's the culture or there's a risk associated with it? Like if they had not done that, they would have never got paid? I think it was more the culture. Mm. I, I believe it's the second as well. It's if the outlet, the, the customer has money available, is who is going to be there first to take it, <coughs> the one who takes it. And if it's the culture that they are not going to put it in the bank and make a wire transfer, then it's somebody has to go there and collect the money. It's the first one. Okay. That's it. We had that in Greece with the capital controls. Our model is uh, again a bit different. So we have uh, the, we are normally from church service center from collections contacting more or less all the customers. I would say. Uh, but uh, in some countries, 
which think about themselves that they are kind of specific as for sales, as for types of customers and so on. So they are pushing us to, to contact customer by themselves. So what we implemented globally, not only in Europe, is that uh, we have the policy about so-called uh, branch handled customers. So if some some customer is quite sensitive and uh, business wants to contact them solely without shared service center, so then uh, it needs to be approved uh, by uh, a respective branch manager or country manager and finance uh, director from a shared service center. And once approved, it's approved uh, first only for one year. It can be renewed then after one year. And uh, during the one year, the, at least once per month, the respective people in the branch, respective person in the branch who is contacting the customer uh, has to inform a shared service center about the status uh, of, of the collections of the customer, okay? And if this information is missing, so theoretically we can go to the uh, decision that we take customer back to shared service center, contact customer directly, but to, to be honest, it did not happen so far. So. And, and do you have a, like, a typical group where they ask for this approval? Like special uh, clients or? Yes, I would say, uh, so it's uh, from European countries, I would say it's uh, basically Spain and uh, partially also France, but more Switzerland, where they think we just cannot contact their customers. And uh, then it's Middle East, but in Middle East there is even the problem with respect to this policy, okay? So they are trying to push us not to contact the customer, but not to have them approved as a branch handle. Mm -hmm. Just to try to skip the policy, let's say. Thank you. That's interesting. I asked the question because in my company, I find that if we have a public sector client, then sales guys tend to want to have you know, the control and they don't let us contact them because they feel that we will just ruin the relationship. And if it's anything else, financial or you know, um, multinational or whatever, normal client, then we have a go and you know, we can just do our jobs. But when it comes to public sector, then we usually bump into a sales guy saying, no, no, no. Yeah. Do you experience the same? Okay, so la some last comment, maybe at the end, or some question. Okay, so I think that's it. Thanks a lot for your activity and voting. Thank you.